Hello. Welcome back to the Space School Lord. Today we're doing What If Luke and Leia were Mandalorian foundlings. Before we begin, special thanks to all of our patrons. The finale of our miniseries comes out this Saturday. Our story begins shortly after former Grand Master Yoda was released from the Tantive IV to the planet of Dagobah. The Tantive IV then appeared outside of Tatooine. Last second, Obi-Wan had asked Bale if he could be the one that took Luke in. Obi-Wan believed that Owen and Beru could be toxic for Luke. Bale was actually perfectly fine with raising both twins. Obi-Wan just had a gut feeling that it would be worse for the galaxy if the Skywalker twins were separated. They should be allowed to grow together. Kenobi also believed that he needed time to reflect upon the events of Mustafar in Order 66, so even if there was something wrong with Owen and Beru, he didn't believe he'd be a fit mind to be of assistance to Luke or help raise Luke. Bell had a shuttle take Kenobi down to the planet, and then when the shuttle returned, chaos erupted. Obi-Wan had no feasible way to get back into space above Tatooine, but he could feel the chaos in the Force. Obi-Wan was dropped off in the middle of the desert because he'd be safer there than anywhere else. The reason for landing in the middle of the desert was to avoid people exposing him for being a Jedi to the Empire. In orbit above Tatooine, the Tantive IV was caught in the crossfire. The survivors of the Siege of Mandalore had escaped the clutches of the new Mandalorian leader Bo-Katan, and they were trying to kill the man who betrayed them, that being Darth Maul. However, the vessel that the Mandalorians were targeting wasn't Darth Maul's vessel, and the ship that was caught in between the crossfire also wasn't Darth Maul's vessel. Though, when the Tantive IV was hit by a massive explosive round, Bail Organa ordered the crew to fire back, and make sure that these pirates knew who they were messing with, and that they were messing with an Imperial Senator. The issue is, though, the Mandalorians didn't really care, and they were even more outraged that the ship fired back at them. Had the Tantive IV taken its shot and continued on its business, then there wouldn't be any issues. One of the Mandalorian Karmic class starfighters, or just a gauntlet class, broke off from the other Mandalorian vessels, and latched itself onto the Tantive IV and they breached into the ship. Leading the charge was a Mandalorian warrior, one loyal to Clan Saxon. Currently, Gar Saxon was one of the few who hadn't escaped Bo-Katan's captivity. Regardless, the Mandalorians charged into the Tant of Four and began blasting away. There had to be valuable luggage on the transport that belonged to a senator, and the members of the Death Watch could certainly use the extra resources. The few Alderanian guards were no match for the Death Watch. It wasn't even a competition for the Mandalorian warriors. The Alderanian guards were wiped out and Bell Organa tried to rush the Skywalker twins to an escape pod in hopes that he could get them to an area where Kenobi was. They had a better chance of survival with Obi-Wan. When Bell rounded the corner, he was shot in the chest, pushing the little pod for the children in front of him as he fell. Bell Organa looked up as he held his chest in his hand with incredible pain. The Mandalorian stationed to guard the escape pods looked down at the little pod and saw two children. They were no longer going to be royalty. They were going to become warriors for the Mandalorians. The Mandalorian stepped forward and shot Bell Organa in the head before taking a hold of the children's pod and relaying over the communication device that there were new Mandalorian foundlings on the vessel. He asked that the ship was clear and he got the okay signal. The children would be taken to the Mandalorian Gauntlet class starfighter and then they would depart from the wreckage of the Tant of Four before it was blown up. The losses included Bail Organa, R2-D2, and C-3PO. But it was a cost of messing with Mandalorians, especially if you couldn't defend yourself from them. The Mandalorians retreated from Tatooine to the moon of Mandalore at Concordia. Now one would assume it would be unwise to set up camp at Concordia, especially if Bo-Katan, famous Night Owl leader and high-ranking officer of the Death Watch, was familiar with it. But the assumption was that Bo-Katan, with Mandalore under her control, would stay on Mandalore and defend Sindari. That so happened to be the truth. Sure, a bunch of the rival Mandalorians escaped, but at the moment, it was Bo-Katan's main mission to defend Mandalore. Because the Republic, now Empire, had invaded, she had a much larger worry to, well, worry about. Mandalore was on the Empire's target list, though it wasn't a top-tier priority, so there was not as much worry for Bo regarding the Empire. That didn't change anything. She had seen her planet go through a civil war during her lifetime, and now Mandalore was entering yet another civil war. Well, it had started a little bit earlier. Bo had to take the mantle that once belonged to her sister. House Kree's was a powerful one. All Mandalorians knew that, but now half of the warrior-like Mandalorians were ready to take said power away from House Kree's. Bo couldn't allow that to happen. She at this point learned the lesson of interacting with soldiers rather than leaders. It was the difference between Pre Vizsla and her sister Satine. Pre Vizsla was a foolhardy warrior who, without the aid of Darth Maul or Count Dooku, would have never held any power over Mandalore, whereas her sister, while flawed, understood the difference between power and leadership, something Bo wished that the Republic could have recognized before it became an empire. 
Regardless, on the moon of Concordia, the Death Watch was setting up camp, right where their previous camp had been set up by Pre Vizsla. The major difference for the Death Watch was the current leader of the group. The power of the group belonged to Clan Saxon, rather than House Vizsla. There was also a distinct difference between both leaders. Pre Vizsla, while a warrior, was impatient. Gar Saxon, who was currently sitting in a prison cell in Sindari, was patient, powerful, and remarkably skilled. He was perfectly fine waiting in prison until the opportune moment. His decision to have Death Watch return to Concordia was a hopeful decision to throw Bo-Katan off, considering Satine had no issue believing that the old Mandalorians had vanished after 20 years. Gar Saxon had no issue waiting out the Kree's sister, the heir to the throne of House Kree's. Gar Saxon had a backup claim formulated, and he gave it away to his men once Maul left. It was a quick, and it certainly wasn't something that could be used for a long-term plan, but it would suffice for now. On Concordia, Luke and Leia were taken out of the gauntlet and taken to the palace that formerly belonged to Pre Vizsla. All the foundlings were being kept in the palace for the time being. Reason being is that it was one of the safest places for them to be in, in case Bo-Katan and the Mandalorians attacked. And two, it was better than to be out there in a camp that was being set up on Concordia. Luke and Leia were by far the youngest foundlings. They were only a mere day old, barely. The foundlings present ranged from three years to nine years old. The Death Watch was hoping of building up their forces and being able to take back Sundari, Mandalore, and the Darksaber. Though they were unaware that the Darksaber wasn't in the hands of Bo-Katan, the Darksaber still belonged to the man, the Sith who betrayed all of them. Maul still had it, and he currently was catching up with Crimson Dawn. His little criminal endeavor was already very sophisticated, and it was already a network, and it built to withstand the Clone Wars, and now it was an era of rebuilding with the Empire. Maul had no doubt in his mind that his criminal empire would succeed within the Empire's reign. On Concordia, the plans of Gar Saxon were going accordingly. Within the first week, the camp would be fully operational, and the Death Watch would move back into an era of silence. Of course, not fully silent. There were frequent skirmishes on Mandalore. Many of the Death Watch members who didn't escape Sundari or Mandalore during the Galactic Republic's invasion were living in the sewers, fighting for their lives. It wasn't long after the Siege of Mandalore that the Republic clone troopers were moved elsewhere for Imperial stationing. During these few weeks, Gar Saxon was able to escape from prison and join his brothers and sisters in the sewers of Sundari. While initially it didn't seem like that big of a deal, considering he was in the sewers, it had a very genuine effect on the Death Watch morale, which gave them the extra boost to break out of Sundari in a skirmish and escape Mandalore to the Moon of Concordia. The Moon of Concordia was set up perfectly for the Death Watch. It was a great place for the Death Watch to rebuild their forces. bo was getting used to the role as leader, but it didn't mean she didn't keep her troops primed for combat. Gar Saxon learned about the royalty taken from the Alderanian corvette over Tatooine, and for a short period, he almost had the children executed, believing that the children had no real chance at fighting on behalf of Mandalore, being that they weren't even Mandalorian. Though he changed his mind, suggesting that if they became foundlings, then there was a chance for them to become true Mandalorians. Of course, they would have to succeed in passing their trials and walk the way. With Luke and Leia being so young, they couldn't do anything. They were just infants, and so the Mandalorians had to raise them, giving them their code, their values, their strengths. Luke and Leia developed into young children after a few short years, and after that same period of time of learning, they became enveloped in the world of combat that Mandalorians were so well known for. Both Luke and Leia were taught everything, how to shoot, how to fight, how to think like a Mandalorian, how to walk like a Mandalorian. It was very ritualistic, even during a time of civil war. Not for nothing, but the Death Watch kept their values, and their foundlings followed the creed dedicatedly. Luke and Leia were just like the other foundlings. By the time the two of them were five years old, they were surrounded by dozens of kids their own age. The Death Watch for the last five years had been raiding Mandalore and Kalvala, killing members of rival clans and houses, taking their young and turning them into their young fighters, and fighting them against their own families. Of course, time to time, some of these kids didn't want to fight their own families, and they'd be kicked out of the Death Watch and forced to survive on Concordia on their own, which typically they didn't last too long doing. Luke and Leia, while both being force attuned and related to the most powerful being in the galaxy, were not the best at everything they did. Luke and Leia being siblings and growing up as siblings relied on each other and were really close with each other. It's not that Luke and Leia were weak, but they were small. 
Their mother's genes were with both of them, and at their age, size was a deciding factor in strength, because as much as they practiced, there was so little they could legitimately do until they started getting close to adulthood to put on actual muscle. Many of the more Mandalorian children were much stronger, built bigger. It was in their genetics to be warriors. For Luke and Leia, they were at the severe disadvantage. This almost resulted in the two children being removed from the Death Watch, but because the twins were so dedicated, they were permitted. Sure, they didn't have the genes or the evident talent, but they had the heart of a Mandalorian, and to Gar Saxon and the rest of the Death Watch higher-ups, they saw this as true potential. While Luke and Leia were at a physical disadvantage, their little minds were filled with the teachings and ideals of the Death Watch. The teachings taught them that Bo-Katan was an insurgent that betrayed the Mandalorians and now ruled over Mandalore, in spite of the true Mandalorian way. This was actually a falsehood, but how else would you indoctrinate your children into your ideals if you didn't lie to them? Gar Saxon and the Death Watch were well familiar with this form of indoctrination, because after all, they were taught to hate the Jedi their entire life, when the Jedi never actually bothered them in person, and most of them never even saw a Jedi in their lives, aside from the ever-elusive appearance of one Obi-Wan Kenobi from time to time. The Death Watch vilified the individuals who saved Mandalore, despite contributing to its overthrow from Darth Maul. While there was a valid argument for all Mandalorians instead of Sindari, considering they aided in the Death Watch ascension into power over the former Duchess, they were the ones who turned against Darth Maul and the Death Watch members who continued to serve an invalid leader. These people on Sindari were the true Mandalorians in their own eyes. To the Death Watch on Concordia, this was a visceral betrayal, and the Skywalker twins were told that Bo-Katan was the villain of Mandalore, and that she was the traitor that they should fear and wish to overtake. So, because of this indoctrination technique made by the Death Watch, Luke and Leia believed that Bo-Katan was some sort of demagogue, when it wasn't really that true. The twins, when not studying their information or training with other foundlings, would find themselves butting their heads with each other. It wasn't malignant by any means, but they were trying to get better, consistently fighting with each other would help, but it was exhausting. The work they had to do was brutal, and the self-training they did after their long days was even more difficult. For several years, Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi would abandon Tatooine and go on the prowl, trying to find the twins, but he could never find them. He never gave up hope, but once he learned the Empire had Jedi Hunters, he slowly began to descend into hiding again. First, Obi-Wan started out on the farming and mining world of Mapuzo, but then the Empire showed up and he was forced to leave. Kenobi didn't want to stay on Tatooine, but he also had nowhere else to go, which eventually led him to meeting up with a former friend in Quinlan Vos, which took him to the path and a completely different direction in lifestyle, helping out those who were trying to escape the Empire. This kind of made Obi-Wan forget about the twins, but it always sat in the back of his mind because he never could find him, and he often wondered if the Jedi had ultimately lost because Sidious discovered them and used them to replace Anakin, who Obi-Wan still believed was dead. When Luke and Leia got older, in the age ranges of 7, 8, and eventually 9, the twins became more of a force to be reckoned with. From time to time, the Mandalorians would do tournaments that were made up of teams of two. This is where Luke and Leia existed and thrived. They in the single tournaments would be successful individually, but not as much. Because of the lack of size of younger years, the twins got really good at their distance practice, which involved using grapples and blasters. Well, not fully loaded blasters, but child-friendly weapons for Mandalorians. When Luke and Leia developed a little bit more physically, they became challengers to other foundlings. This by no means meant that they were winning most of their brawls, but it did mean that they were at the very least winning some of them from time to time. Gar Saxon and all the higher ups realized that they had made a great decision to continue to allow the twins to work with the Death Watch. They could become very powerful allies someday. Gar Saxon could only imagine what Luke and Leia would be like as a duo of Mandalorians when they finally grew up. While the foundlings were doing their daily training, the sound of a Mandalorian gauntlet starfighter flew overhead. The Death Watch was completely blindsided, and it was Bo-Katan. Her and her Mandalorians were here, and they were shutting down this Death Watch holdout. The foundlings were caught up in the middle of the invasion, and ducked for any cover they could. The Mandalorians were not here to kill the Death Watch's foundlings, however, if they got in the way, there was no guarantee in their survival. Bo-Katan was trying to get rid of the Death Watch once and for all, and attacking their homestead here on Concordia was her decision to try and root them out. It was an all-out civil war. The Mandalorians had been fighting with each other over the last nine years, but most of the battles were just skirmishes. This was meant to be the final blow, the battle to completely dismantle the Death Watch and make their species extinct. Sure, they were Mandalorians, but they were more of a threat to Mandalore, just as Darth Maul was. 
With the jump on the Death Watch, Bo-Katan expertly led her Mandalorians on an escapade, and the Death Watch quickly pushed back. The ambush left them fighting for their lives, just as they had nine years before when the Republic showed up on Mandalore. Gar Saxon really tried to rally his troops together, but Bo-Katan's strategy was too good to defend against. The ambush pushed the Death Watch far away from their camp, and Bo-Katan, having achieved a victory, decided not to follow. She knew that these rats thrived in the swamps and deserted lands. However, the spoils of victory were all present, new weapons, more ships, and even better than that, foundlings. bo was no menace. She knew that foundlings were the future of their society, and so every single foundling that survived the initial attack and hadn't escaped with the Death Watch was brought back to Sundari. This included both Luke and Leia. They had been abandoned, and now they were terrified, just as were the kids that were with them, many of them being younger. bo after clearing out the entire camp, would return to Sundari with the new supplies. She would personally take the foundlings to her palace, the same one her sister used to call home. bo knew she was being demonized by the Death Watch. She and her people had captured several foundlings, and they were currently using a system of training to help coax the highly aggressive mindset of the Death Watch foundlings. bo and her new Mandalorians used a system of means to work on the mind. In no way, shape, or form would it affect how the foundling trained. They were going to continue to fully train the children because most of them truthfully enjoyed training, and so taking that away from them would give them one more reason to distrust them and dislike them. bo knew that one thing her people needed to do was show these foundlings that the true villains were the Death Watch, and how they had betrayed Mandalore multiple times before. This brain training would take months worth of conditioning. It required talks, walks, seeing, hearing, and feeling. The foundlings needed to talk with the Mandalorians about what the truth was. bo took special time out of her day to help these foundlings see her as a human, as a leader, and a Mandalorian. It's something she learned from her sister, and, in her own way, she was able to remember her sister through embracing these leadership tactics. It's something that Bo had been learning for the past couple of years, something that Pre Vizsla was too unwise to notice or even use. bo took her amazing skill as a warrior and combined it with the soft, genuine intelligence as a leader that she got from Satine. On top of this, Bo-Katan would take the foundlings across Sundari to see the palace, the living waters, and several other landmarks. It gave the foundlings a new sense of pride, something they never were able to really get on Concordia outside of the stories told to them by the elders and the Death Watch leaders. The feeling that the foundlings felt was just that. Pride, happiness, safety, the feeling that there wasn't a need to scavenge. Mandalorians were proud individuals, and they should embrace their power. This complete 180 from life on Concordia had a genuine quick effect on the foundlings, though not all the foundlings felt the same way about it. So the conditioning would be continued into further extent, though it wasn't negative or even harmful, it was just visual. This was all done through love, too, the big difference here being that love would change their minds, not hatred or repression. Leia was one of the children that didn't really get along with this conditioning. She was really into the Death Watch motives and ideals, which is why their indoctrination worked so well. Luke, on the other hand, was relieved to see that Mandalore had such more promise than the Death Watch led on. Because it was so dreary on Concordia, so much angst and disappointment, it really drags you down, and the Death Watch couldn't get around the whole bo treachery thing. After the first few times, it was cool, but after that, in Luke's mind, it was just like, shut up, we get the point. That's how many of the foundlings felt until their teens, for the most part. At a certain point, it was ridiculous. It was really a foundational issue, and it really got annoying for the Death Watch foundlings. For people that bought into it, like Leia, being removed from it almost felt like taking her breath away. That was a really sick grip of the Death Watch. They manipulated core values of the true Mandalorians to fit their idealistic political values and feelings towards bo -Katan. It intoxicated the true meaning of what it meant to be a Mandalorian, something that while Bo had done well with, certainly wasn't perfect. The truth is, there was no perfect idea of a true Mandalorian. Each respective outlet had their own views on the larger scale Mandalorian society. But the one with the least collateral damage to not just their young, but to society as a whole, was the Mandalorians on Mandalore itself. They weren't warmongers that were shown up by a former pre loyalist. bo also took part in these conditioning methods used on the highly invested former Death Watch members. Again, it had a lot to do with how they viewed not just bo but everything she rebuilt here on Mandalore. 
Bo-Katan and her people would take these children to the sites of war zones. They'd be shown cities with no more populations within them. The children would be forced to see the spoils of war brought to Mandalore by Gar Saxon and the rest of Death Watch. What they did desecrated Mandalore, and it ripped it to its core. And once these children were faced with the reality of the lies they were told by the Death Watch, they slowly but surely came back over to the Mandalorian way. All of them aside from Leia. She felt surreal betrayal from her brother because he didn't stand by her side in this, but it was very obvious that the Death Watch was the villain here on Mandalore. Bo-Katan realized how far the teachings of Death Watch could truly go by seeing what they did to Leia. She wouldn't give up on little Leia though. Bo-Katan needed every Mandalorian to be in this together. Bo-Katan knew more than anyone that hating someone for something forced them to buckle down and fight for their views. Inversely, loving an individual by showing them compassion and even listening to them, even if they're confused about their beliefs, would help coax them down from a hill they didn't need to die on. Nine years of civil war taught Bo that she could do all of this, but it would challenge her to be patient as possible. Because bringing someone down from these radicalized thoughts wouldn't be easy, and never was, and it's why Gar Saxon was very scary. Evil people who believe they're working in the name of goodness are always more powerful, just simply based off of their beliefs. Bo couldn't allow this infectious thought to plague any of these foundlings, and with Leia being the last one left, she took Leia into the throne room. She told little Leia that she could do anything she wanted to her, to prove that she was on her side. Bo wouldn't fight back, she would only defend herself. Leia saw this as an opportunity to kill Bo-Katan, and so she ran forward swinging. Bo didn't move, she let Leia swing, and before making contact, Bo opened her hand and caught Leia's hand. She told Leia that she wouldn't fight her. Leia got angry as she tried to hit Bo again. She moved ever so slightly out of the way. Bo was doing this intentionally. She knew that Leia needed to get her anger out. But showing her that Bo wouldn't ever fight her was to prove that, at least on a subconscious level, she was not a threat. After letting Leia tire herself out, Bo told her that there would never be a real reason to fear her. Leia still had so much reconditioning to do, but for her, this was incredibly necessary. Luke and Leia for the first time in nine years began to separate. This was both a natural pull away from each other and because they needed to be away from each other. Leia was going in and out of anger spikes and rage filled moments and it was unsafe for her brother to be around her. Now this didn't mean they didn't interact with each other, but Leia was having a hard time seeing why Luke could just abandon the lessons they were taught by the Death Watch. Several of the more intense reconditioning methods were focused around going to the living waters and freeing herself from the clutch of the Death Watch. It would in a way give Leia a fresh start, which is something she was familiar with. All Mandalorians, regardless of creed, were taught about the living waters at Sundari, and with said knowledge, Bo and her Mandalorians would include it in their reconditioning. For Leia, it would prove to be a useful tool in her process of coming back to the correct side of Mandalore. With Leia traveling down into the living waters on Mandalore, Luke was making new friends. He and a handful of Mandalorian foundlings, and Death Watch foundlings, were beginning to get along. It was two different subgroups of the same society coming together, and for the adults, it was proof that peace could exist between the warring clans. There was no reason for them to fear the destruction of Mandalore at the hands of their brothers and sisters. Months after the Battle of Concordia, Leia would be able to see eye to eye with the rest of the Mandalorians, and embrace the society here on Sundari. Though it was triggered by an insurgent attack made by the Death Watch, when they bombed a local eatery and dozens of people were killed. In that moment, young Leia realized the cost of the Death Watch's thought process, because it was deadly. Though the big change for the Skywalker twins was the new society they were involved with. Whereas the Death Watch focused on warrior society all the time, the Mandalorians here in Sindari focused on the traditions while not being completely consumed by them. It was incredibly healthy for the mind, because the children weren't focused on survival of the fittest 24-7 and they were able to simply enjoy their lives and take part in the joyous occasions and festivals that Sindari had. The planet may have been under war several times or even multiple attacks within the last couple months, they always found ways to have positivity for most of the people, something that was a genuine culture shock to most of the foundlings of the Death Watch was that not everyone here in Sundari were warriors. The people who wanted to be warriors were, but no one was forced to do something they had no want in doing. It was refreshing to say the least. With Luke and Leia reconditioned to think rationally, they continued down the warrior path. 
which in turn kept them close to Bogotan at all times. While she was the leader of Mandalore, she made a lot of time in her day to partake in the ritualistic exercises of her people. She taught the young, and she helped train some of the weaker ones too. Though Bo was increasingly becoming more stressed, the Empire was breathing down her neck. It wouldn't have made a difference either way if the Republic hadn't broken the peace treaties. Those treaties wouldn't have been a thing that the Empire would ever sign, and they would have technically been invalid by the Republic standard. Bo kept this quiet. She didn't want her people to panic, especially because by this point the galaxy was well aware that the Empire didn't mess around. The Empire and the Emperor himself weren't overly fond of this behavior, and so they appointed Gar Saxon the governor of Mandalore in an effort to push him into controlling a position over Mandalore. Bo didn't know about this. No one did. But that was until an Imperial fleet arrived outside of hyperspace for Mandalore. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of part one of two. Thank you again to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy, Apollo, Mad Minute Suze, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flynn Van Seas, Lord Deadwing, for supporting the channel. Hit 2,000 likes on this video. I think I know what's coming next because it's the season finale of the series. I'm so excited. Um, the season finale is going to be great. I'm working on the full movie for you guys, and that'll come out in one of the subsequent weeks afterwards. So that's going to be cool and all. Um, so let's talk about the first part of the story without going any too deep into it. Obviously, I mentioned this before with certain stories is like when they're young you can't really do much with them and so i could set them up a little bit but i don't like like there's only so much i can really do um with with kids you know like i can i can kind of talk about like individual training but like i can't really go too far into it because they're kids and so the next episode is a little bit more of that like gritty or mandalorian stuff and i'm like i'm super excited for you guys to see it because i've finished it already so it's coming out soon anyways i don't have anything else to say because i don't want to spoil anything and i don't want to say anything that will make me bite my lip so anyways i love you all spread the love and always remember my friends may the force be with you